really, really appreciate it, and uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you go through quickly sort of what the electrical paths are looking like? So going from, uh, do you have micro or do you have a one large inverter? No, I have no micro inverters. Okay. So, so what that chain looks like all the way back to the battery to the meter? And sure, I'll do my best. So each each uh, solar panel. So the question is, what's the what's the pathway? Sort of the electrical pathway, the wires, I guess, from where the solar panels are to all the way to the meter. Um, so each, I have 30, uh, 255 watt panels in uh, our array, um, and each one of those panels has a little micro inverter um, uh, on it. Uh, what that does is it helps manage because they're daisy chained together. It helps manage um, actually shadows. So uh, in, in my location. Uh, there's a big tree that casts a shadow starting about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, if they didn't have those microinverters, it, kind of, it might mess up the efficiency of the system. So my system has microinverters. <coughs> that energy is, that electrical energy is a DC power, so it's um, watts of power. So when you think of power, um, if you think, think of the old uh, incandescent light bulb, so a 40 watt light bulb is a measure of the, the, uh, the power of that light bulb. If you have that light bulb on for an hour, you would use 40 watt hours of electrical energy. So there's a difference between watts and watt hours. I'll get into that in a second. But that DC power, direct current power, goes from the solar panels. It's ganged together at a junction box into one cable that goes into uh, an inverter. The inverter, as the name suggests, flips the energy, uh, uh, the power, I should say, from um, DC power to AC power. Okay. Um, at that point, if our house, and, and that ties into the uh, panel. In, in the garage or the in, one the main one? In the garage. Okay. In the garage. Um, if our house uh, needs that power right now, right? So, so the sun's shining, uh, energy is being produced, and, uh, and we need it. You know, we've got uh, uh, a dishwasher going or something, or lights on or something. It goes immediately to it. It isn't counted. It doesn't go to the meter. Okay. If we then have excess power, so there's more power than we need in that moment, that excess power goes out to the meter, and uh, over time is counted, uh, and as I say, becomes sort of uh, energy that we are credited for um, according to how much we put into the system. Then going the other way, if I have if I have a need for power so the sun's not shining or I'm not producing enough energy for my energy needs or it's at night or whatever, um, then uh, it just goes straight from, just as it, as it always did, from SAS power through the meter into the panel and distributed it to the home. So more specifically, did you have to do any other connections from your sub-panel in the garage back to the main SAS power meter? Can you do the wire or anything there? Or can you do it all from the sub panel in the garage? I'm just trying to figure out if I have to run another wire from the garage to the house. Yeah, or if yeah, I've yeah. got a 200 watt panel in my garage, yeah. and I've only got you know three or four things to use that. So I can answer that if you don't. I can handle it, but I wasn't sure if I need more communication wire. Okay, yeah. so when I installed my system just like four months after Stevens, uh, it was um, a two kilowatt system, and it was on a garage that's far from the house, mm -hmm. so it's like 40 feet or something. So we had just a crummy uh, electrical cable that could do the garage door opener and the lights and a power tool, and that was it. So it wasn't sufficient, so I had to retrench so the solar installers came and retrench, put down conduit, proper conduit this time, and, and uh, so you could pull whatever wires. We put the, the Ethernet cable, which isn't too expensive, put a really big wire uh, from the meter on the house to the sub panel in the garage. So that probably added another thousand or so to the system. Yeah, and I'm just trying to figure out because I've already got a 200 watt or 200 amp panel in the garage. Oh, if you have so a actually more. If you have a 200 amp, you're okay. If you have, if you have a 100 amp panel, I'm yeah. pretty sure that would be yeah. fine. Yeah, I think it'd be fine. I just wasn't sure if there needed to be any sort of communication between the inverter and like the SAS power meter, or so like a cob wire or anything like that. Uh, well, there is one. There is. There's one kind of communication, and actually I found out about it. There's a couple of things I found out about after I got the system in that bugged me a little bit. Um, this is one of them. So um, I remember the first day that after I had the system where there was a power outage, and my system shut down. 
And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, I didn't even benefit. I, I, I actually, in my head, I thought, oh, this is going to be great. Oh, the sun's shining and the power goes out. I'll have to have power. No, it doesn't work that way. And the reason it doesn't work that way is because um, if the power's out, there's a problem with, you know, a, a squirrels shoot through a line or something. So the linemen have to go up. And in order for it to be safe, they need to know that there's no power going to that line. And so it's, um, there is communication between my inverter and the meter for that very reason. Because um, when the meter senses that there's a power outage, it shuts down the inverter. But there is a solution to that. It's more money. Yes. It's called a Generlink. So you install this extra stick out on the meter. It's another hundreds of dollars or a thousand or, or whatever. And the benefit is you can then attach a generator to the bottom of your meater and turn on your generator. It provides power to your panel system and inverter, which turns on again, and you have power in your house. Uh, not any shortage of it because it isn't just coming from the generator, it's coming from the sun. Uh, but then it, it isolates the, uh, the system from the grid so it's safe and it'll be fast power approved equipment. So it's an added expense if you want to get fancy. If you want to do the cheap way like I did, you don't have a Generlink. My parents, they installed the Generlink. They're rural and depend more on it. So. Other questions? Yeah, I'm sure you addressed it last time, but uh, I, I'm one of those people who are wait, wait, wasn't going to you uh, through um, until I figured out whether I need to because there's that, um, the, the advertising about the, uh, the kind of roofing that has solar panels in the they all have to Right, right. Yeah. 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 Are, did you investigate that at all? Is that even realistic? I didn't investigate it. It wasn't around when I uh, did the read because I had my system for three years and it just wasn't available back then. Um, I'll have to admit this about myself as well. It's a, it's a personal you know, choice of everyone. I'm a third generation guy. I don't buy anything until I've seen the third generation of it. That's just that's just me. So until I see the third generation of those um, Tesla tiles in Saskatchewan, I personally wouldn't touch them. So from my understanding, they just did the trial installations in the U.S. in August. So that's the first ones that were being sold commercially. Um, I don't even know if they've installed any in Canada. Yeah, I, I'm on the registered list, and I haven't gotten any communication back from them yet. So. <laughs> it's one of those things. It's a little bit like investing in. And solar panels is a little bit like investing in um, uh, a new computer yeah. and saying, well, if I wait, you know, it'll be faster, and it'll be, uh, you know, it'll be more powerful, you know, and that's been going on for 30 years. Um, to me, it's like if, if the economic case makes sense now, then I encourage people to do it now. I mean, quite apart from the fact that um, there's an environmental benefit, which we don't talk about at all tonight, but yeah, it's a nice little side, uh, you know, byproduct of this activity that, that we're stopping CO2 from getting the atmosphere. So, so, I don't know, to me, the economics are very compelling right now, so waiting, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I personally wouldn't counsel people to wait. Um, uh, the other thing I'll just say is a little personal thing again, is that um, uh, I got into a little bit of a back and forth, actually on LinkedIn one time, about how you know, this one person thought that solar panels were ugly and he's gonna wait until the Tesla tiles came out and blah, 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 and it's this really aesthetic thing. And it's like, okay, well, I don't mind the way they look on my roof. Um, but more to the point, my attitude is, well, if you don't like the look of solar panels, how do you feel about asphalt? <laughs> honestly, how do you feel about concrete? I mean, um, I think there's ways to make it look more attractive, but quite frankly, at the end of the day, I just don't care. It's like, we need solar panels. We need solar panels wherever we can stick them, frankly. I, I really believe that. We, we, we need to start. The, the, the economics make sense. The environmental impact makes sense. It just makes sense. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm getting a bit frustrated with how long it's taking us to get on with this. You know, um, uh, Because to me, it seems so obvious. It really does. It just seems so obvious. I'm not sure why. Um, I just I don't really understand. So so I don't know. I, I, I'm going to try and talk you into getting solar panels and not delay. Uh, I would put a new roof on and then and then uh, you know get a, a tried and true system up there as soon as possible. Mike, I'm going to go. I have to look at. I have the same same issue is that my my shingles will be due in you know within the number of years. I like.
like the look of the Tesla tiles and stuff like that. I've done a little bit of looking at the cost. So what I can tell is that for my roof, maybe like a 1300 square foot bungalow, it looks like it would be um, like between 30 and $35,000 US, US. So that's going to be 45000 Having said that, you get maybe a $10,000 Bring them right as far as 50% rebate. Right. Well, well, I was thinking more of you know, yeah. you've got, you're going to be putting singles on your roof and then solar panels, so you've got ten thousand dollars premium to put your yeah. But the problem is, right now, is there's no information about what the power output is or anything like that. So, without, without that being available to me, it's just kind of a, really not an option. I don't know how long you wait for that, knowing that it's still probably going to cost. So, to sort that context, that it's $40,000 Canadian or a quote for my own, so for uh, 15 dollars for the You're looking at the program. Yeah, we had a question back there. Is there a reason you need to go with uh, battery storage? Say again? Is there a reason you need to go with battery storage? Like, Is there a reason they didn't go with battery storage? Sure. Um, at the time, it wasn't it, it wasn't really even on my radar as a cost competitive possibility to go with battery storage. And frankly, net metering with SAS Power um, is kind of battery backup, right? and it's free. And, and, and this is the thing. This is a bit of the elephant in the room. I mean, I don't know if there's anyone from SAS Power here, but they're in a they're in a very tricky position. I, I really feel for SAS Power because. Um, this is a this is a big disruption to their business model, and utilities all over the planet are dealing with this and struggling with this. Um, this is a this is this presents a really big problem for SAS Power, and they need to they need to innovate their business model to be able to accommodate this. Because the more people that go on solar, the more people there are like me, um, the fewer people there are buying power, buying the thing that SAS Power is selling, and so. So they're in a really, really tricky position. But the benefit right now, and this is the thing that we stand to benefit from people get in before November 2018, is the 20% rebate, that's great, but it's really the ability to have power whenever you need it and uh, to be able to, to have this kind of power account, if you will. So my power account is, um, uh, in fact, I brought my last power bill, just to, and if anyone wanted to see it, I paid 28 bucks, and, and none of that was for power, it was just to be hooked to the grid. And it shows what my account um, balances are. It shows how many kilowatt hours credit I've got, uh, and it shows how much I used last month, and, uh, and it shows the difference. Um, and I'm, I'm right now, I'm kind of consuming that uh, credit all the time. But, uh, but so it didn't make financial sense for me to go with batteries. But, but just to kind of finish the thought on that, that is changing really quickly. The, the economic argument for me to actually cut the cord to South Power, um, there is an economic argument right now. The number, the, the, the tipping point number is, um, I calculated it to be about 25 cents a kilowatt hour. So if SAS Power's rates today was 25 cents a kilowatt hour, for me, for my situation, it wouldn't actually make sense for me to stay as a SAS Power customer. It would make more sense for me to cut the cord, buy more panels, buy some battery, uh, uh, battery backup, buy a generator backup for the backup, and be done with it. And because the price of batteries is dropping so quickly, that number is going down all the time. So three years from now, that number might be 18 cents a kilowatt hour. And while I'm talking about the cost of power, it's worth mentioning that in Saskatchewan, we don't pay that much for power. People think we do. We don't. On a global basis, we don't. I, I grew up in Australia. My brother still lives there. He pays 26 cents a kilowatt hour. So it's double what we pay, right, for power. My sister um, lives in London, in England. She pays 25 cents a kilowatt hour for power. We pay 13.74. It's it's not that much. Globally, again, you can look this stuff up. We are we are right at the bottom in terms of what we pay for power. Um, how is that all going to mesh together? Who's going to work? Yeah, I, yeah, and I can't answer the question, and that's something we have to kind of. So, from a cost perspective of batteries, essentially all you're going to save is the $29 a month, which is your mandatory minimum monthly fee. So, a Tesla Powerwall, for example, is roughly $7,000. 
So divided by 29, your payback on that is almost 21 years. So at this point in time, all you're gonna save is at $29 a month. The economics don't make sense unless you're looking at it as opposed to a natural gas uh, generator, so you always have power. You know, so someone plays a value on that. What I like about it is it takes you right off the yeah, yeah, yeah. Right and again, there's, there's your own that are doing it. Have it or they can stop that program tomorrow. They can take it off that tomorrow if they, yeah. like you say, they're in a conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there's no question. Yeah. Um, and more people go on it, the more money they So they'd have a legal issue if they canceled the net metering program for existing subscribers. They could easily cancel the program to prevent new subscribers, but they'd actually have a legal case in their hand if they all of a sudden went to you tomorrow and said, we're canceling the program. Yeah, I can't speak to that. I, I know they have they, one. Well, it's actually a contract. They, they, yeah, they, they, they have, they have a, a lot of upset people. So yeah. I guess this is along that, along those lines of the talk about the, the deadline of November 2018. Um, so that's the deadline in order to get on the, to have like a contract for net metering? Is that, is that what the deadline is? Or what is the, what well, is the Well, in terms deadline? of, so well, what I understand it to be is that that is the, that is the date that Saskara has extended the current net metering program to, okay? The current net, net metering program, the key elements are, it's 20% rebate on a free portion. So for me, uh, our system was 28 grand. We got five grand back. Okay, so so um, it, it was. A, I think that we have to like eighteen percent or something. Because there's a few things that aren't that aren't covered up. So that's one. The other thing is that the one for one credit. So when I'm putting in the grid, but is that a contract that you? It's so it's a contract. They can't, they can't just cancel that. Yeah, it's a, at it's the a, end of November. You know what? I I I don't know if they can. can I honestly don't know. It's a big big contract. Um, My understanding was that the, if the paperwork is in by November twenty eighteen, then it. They have, it has to be for for a length of years. Well, <coughs> there has to be a commitment from a company to be installing it. It can happen after November 2018. But, but, but as far as whether it's like even this, this length of oh, one to one, I, yeah. I, 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 just, I just don't know. I honestly just don't know if that's something that SAS Power could within the scope of the current contract eliminate. I can't speak to that. I think it would be crazy for them to do that because they, they have, it would be an incentive to cut the cord, it would be, it would cause all kinds of angry people, I would be one of them. Um, but I don't, I, I just don't know from the legal perspective that they might be able to do that. And someone asked that question two weeks ago with this ask power, when I was here. I was so busy I could. No, I only asked, asked, asked when, uh, when there'd be notification on what I was hoping to get some lead time up to that date to say, well, <coughs> right now it just says this program will be reevaluated at that time, which would mean that it continues on as it is. They could, they could increase it to our benefit, they could, you know, they could do anything. Um, I was wondering what, you know, if there's going to be a lead time provided for that date, they could provide that at this point. They, they changed it last time November about two years ago and it was 30% previously instead of 20% uh, so in 2010 I know it was 30% and they changed it one November and said here it is and then about a year ago they said we're wrapping this up in some way or changing it November and they, they won't say until November of next year because they don't want to poison people's choices about what do we do? Do we go with 20% or do they bump it back up to 30 or do they knock it to 10 or 0 and go with a feed-in tariff? Nobody knows and they probably won't say for legal reasons even. Question? If there was a major storm and the transmission lines were down, does that mean that even with your solar panel, unless you have this extra connection, you don't have power? Correct. Okay, or what is there any damage from hurricanes? 
I don't. I don't. I, don't. I, I read an article and there was, they've got a couple of large explosions in Puerto Rico, and essentially they almost came through unseen. Uh, they were more central to the islands, they weren't on the coast of Embattled in the same way, but they survived very high form of our wind. I mean, these were commercial installations, so the level of professional for install you know, was probably a factor in there, but. Uh, I, I only know the experiences that I've had, so I've had two major weather events uh, since I've had the panels that have actually caused, the first one caused damage to both of my vehicles, the second one caused damage to my house. Nothing to the panel. The panels have been fine. Um, I, I mentioned at the first meeting that um, we had a hailstorm and it actually cleaned the panels. So they got, they, they started to call this. part of the issue. This is part of the conundrum. Um, I mean, I talked a little bit about this in the presentation a couple of weeks ago, uh, just with regard to how compelling a zero marginal cost proposition is. And so no matter how cheap coal is and no matter how cheap gas is and so on, you can't be zero marginal cost. You can't be free energy, um, especially when the delivery and storage mechanisms for that get figured out, which is happening very quickly. And so SAS Power is in, you know, I, I think SAS Power is awesome, by the way. I think they've done just an amazing job of powering our problems. And I think they've got a really, really tough job ahead of them to figure out what to do. But um, they need to figure it out. I mean, it's really, when you think about it, it's no different than what happened to, you know, say Kodak. It's a good, actually, comparison. Kodak uh, had basically been uh, made bankrupt by digital uh, cameras. Uh, the loss of the marginal cost associated with, with uh, photography. And so Kodak is no more. Um, other big corporations that had great business models that worked for however long they worked for, but then those business models got disrupted by new technologies. And the mistake that some of these companies made, Kodak was one of them, is that they didn't innovate their business model to absorb the innovation of technology. Right? They tried to use that innovative the new technology with an old business model. Bad idea. You know, that's part of the problem of trying to sell less power, and at the same time trying to sell on how to use less of it. So <laughs> I know that's the you know this is the conundrum. This is why it's like it's they they have another big problem too. They've been tasked with going 50% renewable within 13 years which is totally totally doable. We could do it probably in three years for every household, maybe not industry, if we had the labor to build the solar. The big issue I see is that SAS Power is planning to build a 350, watt, 350 megawatt natural gas plant at Swift Current in two years, so 350. And they're only planning about maybe 160 wind and maybe 60 solar in that same time. So while we're at a deficit of renewables, we get most of our renewables from Manitoba indirectly, and we have 3% wind, they're planning to still build more fossil fuel, and they don't even have a plan to, to build enough renewables. And that, nobody seems to be talking about this yet for some reason. I've been trying to point it out to people when I have the chance. But the numbers obviously don't make sense. So something's wrong at SAS Power right now. They aren't ramping up like they're supposed to be. Uh, and they just announced uh, on November the 4th or 3rd that they're potentially shelving doing carbon capture on boundary dams and sites that were four and five. Oh, and they, shut, and they stopped the uh, hydro plant in the f extreme uh, north uh, east of the province, uh, is what I read briefly a month ago. That uh, I, I don't know how to say it, Tazi Twe or something, the hydro dam up there that they were considering, because we have so little hydro actually in the province, that, but they are stalled on that. So even fewer renewables in, in the province. So SAS Power needs to be held to task, and right now, I don't know, I'm hoping we're very successful and can manage to do that indirectly or directly. Yes, back. you wind up the end of the calendar year, Carry that across the next year? Or no. they zero it in the they, zero, they zero the account um, 
I think it's at the end of March next. Um, and it, it actually makes sense. Um, it's kind of a, uh, a disincentive to overbuild. It's, it's like an incentive to build um, uh, a system that's big enough for your needs, but not more. Um, so what happens is, in my case, for instance, starting in April is when I start to overproduce, just because the, the days are start to be longer and the, the sun is at a better angle for my it's system and so on. So I start to overproduce, and that's perfect because then I can start accumulating those credits um, that I work toward. Um, uh, so right now, for instance, I'm sitting on about 1,000 kilowatt hours of credits, and I will use those over the next two or three months. I'll run out of those credits probably mid, mid January, late January, early February, um, and uh, and then I'll I'll have to pay for that power. Now, if I had a bigger system, uh, and in fact I'm looking to add to my system because I want to get an EV, and so I want to be able to produce more. And let's say that I expand my system so that I that I overproduce and I'm not using it up, then yes, that that gets zeroed out uh, April first. Um, so you lose those credits. And some people, it annoys some people. It actually doesn't bother me that much. I, I'm, I'm sort of fine with it. I sort of get the logic. And by the, by the way, I am I, I'm not saying anyone here is, but I am absolutely not a SAS power basher. I think they've done an extraordinary job of providing power to our problems. I think they're facing a really tricky um, future. And I, I honestly feel for the people that work there, because uh, you know there, there are a lot of good people that work at SAS Power and they're doing their darndest to make sure that we have power in the province. So, so I, I, I think there's some challenges, and I think uh, certainly there's politics and all that stuff involved. I, I don't, I'm not very good at that stuff, but I, I like to just be able to talk things through. But, uh, um, but yeah, I mean they're, they're facing it's 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 uh, it's scary. I think for them. Is that the question here? Yeah. of energy on uh, individual household installations, even if it's pulled together, versus the larger uh, project like they did in the block. Uh, I know there's, like, there's some fixed investments, the uh, two-way meters and so on and so forth, and uh, it's cheaper, obviously, for the larger. Yeah. Do you have a sense of how much cheaper it is? Well, you know, the cost of per installed water power I actually Google that probably once or twice a month to find where it is across the planet because um, it really does vary and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me sometimes. So for instance, in Australia, because I have family in Australia, the cost per installed watt is uh, some, in some places under $2 an installed watt. Um, and the Canadian dollar and the Australian dollar are not that far apart and they're sort of very similar um, in terms of the economics of the countries and so on. So it's like, well, why would that be? And I think a big reason is that um, uh, people are, for, for solar vendors, I think that there's um, uh, there's a lineup of people that, that are pre-educated, their neighbors have it, other people have it, and so and they've already done the assessment, they've talked to their neighbors who have it, and they've done all that work that I'm asking you guys to do, sort of um, uh, naturally, just through discussions and so on, um, and they've, and they've and then now they're lining up, and so the solar vendors don't have to do, you know, all the soft costs are frankly gone. They're just like, they're just putting up solar panels, and so their cost to do that is now, a, it's, a, it's a, a pure cost in a way. It's moving toward really a commodity. It's, it's, it's moving in that direction, right? Um, and so, uh, so I think your question is about, well, how, how, how cheap could it get? It's more the large model. Yeah. Like if a person was just interested in, you know, what if you're replacing you know, X amount of, of power generation that is uh, or carbon emissions, if it's on my house versus if it's on a, a larger place and I'm putting my money in, for some people, it's not, it may not matter if it's on my house, it's fine. Yeah, I don't have the exact numbers, just that the economies of scale apply, right? So yeah. bigger what was the installed watt cost of again? Mine was 3.66. 3. Yeah. And, and so looking at the Saskatoon model, I think they said there were somewhere around 50 or, they were above 3, I know that, 